Hello, and welcome to Burning Issues, the only program that provides you a glimpse inside the Wichita Fire Department. I'm Captain Stuart Bevis. In this episode, we'll talk about burn injury care and treatment, along with some basic steps to prevent burn injuries in the home. Annually in the United States and Canada, more than 500,000 people receive medical treatment for burn injuries. Roughly half of these injuries are from being scalded. Most burns occur in the home, usually in the kitchen or bathroom. Burn injuries are painful and require prolonged treatment. They may result in lifelong scarring and even death. But there's good news. There are some simple things you can do to protect yourself and your family, which we'll talk about today. <laughs> I'd like to welcome Rhonda Lusk and Gracia Tipton to the Burning Issues program. Thanks Thank for you. coming, ladies. It's good to be here. Thank you. Rhonda has been an RN for 26 years. She is the Community Health Coordinator for Via Christi Outreach and is also um, the coordinator for Safe Kids Wichita Area Coalition. Uh, Gracia has been a nurse in the Burn Center for 17 years and she enjoys the challenge of caring for burns through all the different stages of healing. Um, welcome to the program and I'm very excited for you guys to be here today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, when we talk about burns, uh, most people think about large fires and things of that nature. What are the most common causes of injury that you see in the burn unit? Um, we see uh, burns from house fires, um, which also can include an inhalation type injury. Uh, we see a lot of scalds uh, with children, um, cooking accidents, um, children, you know, pulling pots down off the stove. So scalds from, from hot liquids and also some flame um, burns due to um, campfires or accelerant being put on fires, that type of thing. Okay. So um, the severity of burn injury varies a lot to a lot of different factors. How are burns classified? How do we classify those? Uh, there's three classifications, um, first, second, and third degree. The first degree is a superficial minor burn like a sunburn. Um, second degree is deeper. It can be the most painful burn because it's got the nerve endings exposed. Um, and third degree then is the deepest burn, which uh, would require skin graft to heal. Okay. And uh, you mentioned scald burns uh, initially. Um, how do most of the scald burns occur? A lot of them occur um, accidentally uh, due to bath water uh, temperature being set too high, uh, cooking accidents, um, toddlers around the cooking area and pulling pots off the stove, um, hot you know, macaroni and cheese or ramen noodles, that kind of thing. It's, it's pretty common. So um, are juveniles the most affected by scalds or are there other people that are affected by those? Um, I would say it's a higher percentage of children, yes. Okay. Um, does it take very long to receive a scald injury of that type? No, it can um, take very little time, um, you know, three to six seconds for a child to be burned if the water is hot enough. Oh, that's not very long. Um, and I know that uh, we have a poster that, you, mm -hmm. that illustrates that we'll have uh, on the site. We do. And actually, it takes only about one second if you're at 155 degrees, which would be like a cup of coffee or hot chocolate. So it's very quickly, and we really need to do all we can to prevent these in the first place. Well, how, how can we prevent scald injuries? One of the things like Gracia talked about is when we cook, we want to make sure we use the back burners of the stove, turn our pot handles away. Kids typically can pull something off a counter or pull on a tablecloth that pulls something hot on top of them. And another place we see burns are, of course, in the bathroom with the bath water. So we want to make sure if we're putting a child into the bathtub, we take the time and check the water first. And we want our water heater set no higher than 120 degrees. That's a very important tip. Um, I know that uh, people like to have hot baths, but that can lead to some very serious issues. Um, is there like a rule of thumb, um, you know, where you can test the water if you don't have a uh, temperature gauge or something? Sure. And we have things you can purchase like um, thermometers that you can use. But the bottom line is we want the adult to test the water with their arm first before they ever put the child in. And once you do put your child in, make sure they're not facing towards the faucet so they can't get a hold of that faucet and turn on the hot water. Oh, that's a great idea. Um, if somebody suffers a burn, what should they do? The first thing is to stop the burning process, so to uh, remove the involved clothing um, and cool, cool the area with um, cool water, no ice, do not apply ice, um, and then just cover it with a dry dressing or dry blanket. Um, that's the most important thing is to stop the burning process. Okay. Um, so when you sh should they seek medical aid? Should they just wait and see what happens, or at what point should they go um, to somebody professional like you? Well, <laughs> if, if it's a, 
a um, you know second degree burn, which which the the people might not know that, mm -hmm. but um, if it's causing a lot of pain, they need to come into the burn center. Uh, if it involves the um, hands or feet or face genitalia, um, definitely need to be seen by a burn center specialist. Um, that's usually the criteria. And, and I know you mentioned this that the second degree burns are very painful, but also they're by a lot of blistering is, right. is one yes, of the symptoms of that. So mm -hmm. people know if they're starting to see a lot of blistering, they probably ought to get looked yeah, at. Yeah, correct. Okay. Um, what are some of the uh, treatments that are used to, to help burn patients? In the burn center, we use a lot of Vaseline, uh, believe it or not, for first and second degree burns because it acts as a clean covering and uh, keeps the air and um, dirt out, helps with healing. Uh, we also use some antimicrobial um, soak solutions on some of the deeper burns. We're using a lot of silver um, products right now because that helps as an antimicrobial. Um, but Vaseline really is um, really popular. Yeah. Well, I, I know that the time I've spent in the burn unit, it's, it's very clear that there's some very specific professionals in there. So if somebody's injured, please seek the professional help mm -hmm. so uh, you can be dealt with uh, in the yes. proper way. And don't put any um, creams from your home um, okay. on the burn prior to coming in. Great. Well, I'm going to shift gears a little bit, and we're going to talk um, some more some about maybe avoiding burns and about how to get out of the house if we ever have mm -hmm. a fire. Uh, sometimes we can have fire strike even if we're very careful and we plan ahead and have good fire safe behavior. Um, how can we prepare, prepare ourselves and our families in case uh, fire strikes at our house? You just mentioned being prepared and the best thing we can do is to plan and practice a home fire escape plan and we need to do that and we have some great tools that can help us do that like a fire escape plan map and we can draw out so that we know two exits out of each room in our house. And this needs to be a family affair. We need the whole family involved in that. And remember, we may only have as, as little as three minutes to get out of a house when it's on fire. So we need to teach our kids what to do in case of a fire, how to get out, and make sure that they have a meeting place that's outside the house that once you're out, you never go back in. And we call 911 once we're out of the house, not while we're inside. Those are some great tips, mm -hmm. and I know that those are things that the fire department have uh, talked about for years and years, but it's still some things that we encounter. Um, you mentioned a meeting place. Um, mm -hmm. Can you expand on that? Why, why is a meeting place so important? The meeting place is critical. That's one of the most critical parts of the home fire escape plan, because once you're out of the house, we need to make sure and know that everyone got out okay, so that when the fire department arrives, we know if somebody's trapped inside and where they might be. So the meeting place needs to be a mailbox, a tree, um, a neighbor's home, someplace outside of the home, everyone goes and stays once, the, once they're out of the house. Yeah, that's a very, very good point. Um, there's nothing worse than uh, for a fire crew than showing up and believing that there's children in the house, and so they're going to work very, very hard to try to find that child, and then to find out maybe they're in the backyard on a swing set or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, it puts a lot of people at harm, so we, we don't want to, we want to avoid that. Um, what do we need to tell our kids about calling 911? You know, we can start teaching our kids prevention from a very early age. Calling 911 is one of the best things we can teach them. And when we do that, we need to make sure they know that what an emergency is, like your house is on fire, and why we call 911, who responds to us. And then once we teach them the numbers to call 911, we want to make sure they know what to do when they get somebody on the other end. And that includes giving your name, your address, so we need to teach them their address. Also teach them their mom and dad's names. And then we need to teach them to hold on to that um, phone call. We don't hang up until the operator tells us to. They may need more information or they may give us first aid tips or things like that. Yeah, that, that is very important. Uh, I know that there are times that we kid with the, when we're doing uh, education with the kids, we say, do we call 911 for a pizza? <laughs> no, or not to talk to firefighter Bob, you know, it's mm -hmm. only when we have an emergency. Right. Um, is there some place where viewers can get more information about the fire escape plans? Absolutely. The Via Christi website, viacristi.org, or the Safe Kids website, or the Wichita Fire Department are all great places. They have the tools on there. You can print them off and it has all the information you need to plan and practice your own fire escape plan. And one other thing I would remind people is if you have grandparents, aunts and uncles, other people who stay at your house, include them in your fire escape plan. We never know when a fire may happen. That's, that's very important. Um, now, uh, before, when we have a fire in our home, 
Um, statistics, statistics tell us that most of the time it happens we're not aware. Mm -hmm. um, small fires we can find when we're you know uh, aware of what's going on, but when we're asleep is when the big issue. And so I want to talk a little bit about how are we made aware of a fire when we're asleep or um, unconscious. Mm -hmm. What can you tell us about? That? And that's where our smoke alarms come in. We want to make sure we have working smoke alarms. Every smoke alarm needs to repl be replaced every 10 years, even if it's hardwired into the home. And then most smoke alarms now are made with a 10-year lithium battery, but we still need to check those every month just to make sure they're working. And one of the ideas that you can do is to plan and practice your home fire escape um, drill at night and see if your children wake up. If they're really heavy sleepers, you may want to put a smoke alarm in their room so it's closer to them. And if you sleep with a door shut, then you need to um, make sure that you have a smoke alarm in your room as well. And Rhonda, what can our viewers do if maybe they're in a situation where they don't have a working smoke alarm? Mm -hmm. We just received a grant that we're working with the Wichita Fire Department to implement. It's called Project Get Alarmed, and we are working with Safe Kids Kansas and the Motorola Foundation to receive smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors. So if someone is unable to afford smoke alarms or CO detectors, they can call us, and if they own their home, we will um, have trained personnel come out. They have to install that in your home, and we will provide education as well on fire safety. So they can call us either through the fire department or through our health connection number, and we'll provide that for you. Okay. So if they call Safe Kids, then they can arrange to have somebody come out and install a smoke alarm and a carbon monoxide detector. Correct. Well, that, those are incredibly good tools to uh, alert us if there's any issues mm -hmm. in the house. Well, I'd like to thank them for coming and talking with us today about burn safety and home escape plan. If you'd like to become more involved in the city of Wichita, or if you want to learn more about the Wichita Fire Department, you can go to wichita.gov, Fire Department link. Check us out on Facebook or call the Fire Department at 268-4441. That concludes this episode of Burning Issues. Our mission is to provide our community excellent, proactive fire and life safety services through prevention, education, and protection. Remember, Wichita firefighters are highly trained professionals who are your friends and neighbors. They're Wichita's bravest and they are somewhere serving you every day.